Hi, Gabrielle. Hey, what's up, Madhu? How are you? Good. Um, so I just wanted to introduce this session. Um, so this is I Am a Japanese Writer. Yes. Um, a book, a novel by Danny Laferriere, uh, translated yes. by David Hommel and published by Douglas and McIntyre in Canada. So we're yes. talking about this um, wonderful book. Oh, and also, um, happy St. Geordie's Day. Here are the flowers that I'm giving oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, that it, it is the um, most wonderful holiday, right? Um, well, don't you think that you and I probably, according to La Ferriere, would be Catalan writers? Because clearly, that is a, that's like a holiday for us, books and flowers. I think so. Um, okay, so I am a Japanese writer. Are you? Well, it's interesting. Because I think that maybe, according to this, <laughs> I've certainly um, appreciated that question or being raised as a question. I mean, I think this is like one of the funnest parts of this book, how it plays with identity politics and how complete, well, first of all, for people who have never seen this edition, I just think it's crucial to recognize that Danny Laferriere is a Haitian writer who then moved to Montreal, where he's really made his name, and he, and he kind of currently lives between Montreal and Miami now. And just that this is a Japanese voodoo doll on the cover of this book, so that it's so, like, there's a kind of Haitian iconography that's been transformed into kind of, so it's like all about stereotypes, really, like the stereotypical kind of sumo wrestler meets voodoo doll with the pins and just kind of the playfulness of that, which feels very different from a lot of US takes on identity politics. Um, and as we'll talk in a minute, sometimes he goes too far and I'm just like, um, are you critiquing racism? Or are you an actor? Like, what are you doing, homeboy? But I love his work so much. And um, at the beginning, on page eight, he just says, well, and this is when he's talking to, he's talking about fish, and which is also kind of funny and going to the fishmonger. But anyway, I don't even know if the anxiety comes from starting a new book or from becoming a Japanese writer. And there lies the fundamental question. What is a Japanese writer? Someone who lives and writes in Japan or someone who was born in Japan and writes in spite of it? There are nations that are happy without writing or someone who was not born in Japan, who doesn't know the language, but who decided one fine day to become a Japanese writer. That's my situation. I have to get it through my head. I am a Japanese writer, as long as I'm not that naked writer who enters the forest of sentences with no weapon other than a kitchen knife. I mean, what do you think about that? This whole thing, as long as I'm not that naked writer who enters the forest of sentences with no weapon other than a kitchen knife. I mean, this, what strikes me about this moment is that it's, it's also at the end of a um, section called an anxious salmon. So he's been cooking salmon. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's, what's interesting about this book is it moves between these moments of like reflection and like interesting thought and, you know, thinking that his work is always really provocative. Right. Um, but there are these moments of real, like, interesting thought. And I think that's partly what keeps you going. It's like, you, you just don't always, you don't know what's coming around the corner. Um, so I didn't see that sentence coming, you know. Um, no. The naked writer who enters the forest of sentences with no weapon other than a kitchen knife. Um, but I also think, like, he moves between different kinds of registers, right? Like, this, this section follows, I think, you know, he opens the book with this slightly more comedic, moment. Um, I, I will just read this moment with the, um, he's in a store. So um, the, the narrator, let's say it's Danny Laferriere. Danny, yeah. <laughs> um, has, you know, told his agent or his publisher that he's going to write a book called, um, and all he, all he has is the title, which is I Am a Japanese Writer, and sold. The book is sold. He gets his uh, money, his advance, and, um, and then now he has to write the book, which he's actually not going to write. But then he actually does write because we have because book. it's the book that we're reading, right? But um, so it's about this process of writing this book. I am a Japanese writer, and so he goes to the fishmonger, um, who is Greek, and um, he says, uh, 
just before he leaves, um, he says, the fisherman, a Greek, touches my forearm as he hands me my salmon, skillfully wrapped in brown paper. Are you going to write a second book? I've written 14 books, but he's still stuck on the first. 20 years have passed, and he still asks me the same question. He's not interested in my answer. On to the next customer. On my way out, just to gauge the to Gaisha's reaction, I tell him, I am a Japanese writer. His eyes cut back to me. How's that? You change your nationality? No, that's the title of my new book. A worried glance at his assistant, a young man busy wrapping fish. My fishman never looks at the person he's speaking to. Do you have the right to write the book? No, to say you're Japanese. I don't know. Are you going to change your nationality? No way. I already did that once. That's enough. You should find out about that. Where? I don't know, at the Japanese embassy? Can you imagine me waking up one day and one morning and telling my customers I'm a Polish butcher? I think you'd be a Polish fishman since you are in fish. Anything but a Polish fishman, he answers, turning back to the next customer. A guy who gives you his opinion about everything always ends up planting a seed of disquiet in your brain. I decided to call my publisher and ask him. He shouldn't have any objections. I mean, I think like those two moments, you know, the one that you read and what I just read, it's like, it's funny, but then there's just these moments, like he's like, it's both a shtick and then it's also there are these moments of just like genuine like reflection. Um, you know, we, I think that's one, one thing that is interesting to me about this book is like, you don't really know where you stand often, you know, like there's, it's like, okay, this is a joke, this is a title. He, but then he's genuinely talking about identity, but what is he saying about identity mm -hmm. and disturbing? Uh, it's, 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 um, it's certainly a, a book that doesn't let you, um, I feel like Denny Laferriere is a writer who you can't, whose work you can't dominate, mm. which is interesting. Um, and, you know, you can't kind of feel like, okay, I've got it, you know? Um, he slips. Yeah. He plays. Um, and it's also, I mean, that passage you read is really important because the whole book is also, um, it's two, it's many things at once, but it's, it's a spoof on the publishing industry that you would get in advance for writing something provocative, which is exactly kind of how La Ferriere came out into the literary world and moved out of the poverty of being um, kind of a really a refugee journalist from Papadox, Haiti, coming into Montreal and then working in like a turkey factory and determined to use writing as a way to get out of the factory. So then his first novel for people who might not know was called How to Make Love to a Negro Without Getting Tired. And it was really funny because I remember on my first trip to Haiti that that book was in the store and my cousins were teasing me because I was like, well, what is that over there? And they're like, oh yeah, we know you want to read that or whatever. But um, so I always, I think I've always associated something about Daniela Laferriere with my own kind of questions of, or just relationship to Haitian literature, Haitian culture, Haitian identity, but also the reality that, you know, he's written so many books about so many things and it's, it's only the most salacious and provocative ones, let's say, that have been translated into English. Mm. It's only the ones that have, that's not completely true because I guess in the 90s, David Hamel did do like a drifting year. He translated some of the other stuff, but the stuff that's in print right now, this book, you know, the Haitian writer saying, I'm a Japanese writer, heading south, which was the um, premise of that, that it's about sex tourism, basically. Although the book is less about sex tourism than the movie that starred Charlotte Rampling, which is a wonderful movie, but um, there's that book. And then How to Make Love to a Negro. Those are really like the works that are in English with these provocative titles. And then his more gentle kind of like looking at his Haitian past or looking at his grandmother growing up, the aroma of coffee, whatever that is. Nobody want to hear it. Nobody, nobody want to read that. You know what I mean? So he's aware of it and he works that into the book as well. Do you want to read that passage um, where he's talking about um, reading Mishima? Like yes. There are, there are these moments when the Haitian past comes through and it comes through in a way I think that's really quite interesting and touching actually. And also because what it, one of the things he's also doing is playing with the notion of Haiti or Haitians as like primitive mm -hmm. or that. I mean, so just the whole idea. And so this is on page 13. Please understand, I was never obsessed with Mishima. As a teenager, 
I came across one of his novels at the back of some old cupboard along with a bottle of rum. I began with a long gulp of liquid fire. Then I opened the book, The Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea, and a swarm of buzzing vowels and consonants flew into my face. They had been waiting forever for a visit. In a case like that, you don't start classifying. You don't look that gift horse in the mouth. Mishima's book didn't say to itself, well, well, here's a good old Japanese reader. And I didn't look for a kindred spirit, recognizable colors, or shared sensibility. I dove into the universe that was set before me the way I dove into the little river not far from my house. I hardly even noticed his name, and it wasn't until long afterward that I realized he was Japanese. And then later, at the end of that passage, so this is one of his big, I think, like manifesto moments in the book. Do you want to read that one? I don't understand all the attention on page 14. Uh, so he writes, I don't understand all the attention paid to a writer's origins, because for me, Mishima was my neighbor. Very naturally, I re repatriated the writers I read at the time, all of them, Flaubert, Goethe, Whitman, Shakespeare, Lope de Vega, Cervantes, Kipling, Senghor, Césaire, Rumet, Amado, Diderot, they all lived in my village. Otherwise, what were they doing in my room? Years later, when I became a writer and people asked me, are you a Haitian writer, a Caribbean writer, or a French language writer? I answered without hesitation. I take on my reader's nationality, which means that when a Japanese person reads me, I immediately become a Japanese writer. Wow. And I think that to me is so interesting about, I mean, this is a book then that's also about wanting to be read. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's about reading, what reading, it's like, to me, it's like, in fact, what in some, he says it somewhere, but in a way it's like, it's about being in the nationality or the tribe of the readers and writers. Well, and he also ties that to his Haitian background too, where he talks about walking with his grandmother and seeing like a gentleman reading, like sell like a table full of books and a gentleman reading and his grandmother saying like, that's a reader and him being like, that's what I want to be when I grow up, a reader. You know what I mean? Not even like a bookseller, but a reader. I mean, it's such a utopian idea and it's a kind of an old fashioned humanistic idea. You and I both studied comparative literature. And I just remember at the beginning of that, like this notion of like, what was world literature and what does it mean to be in world literature and who gets to go there? What is a major literature versus a minor literature? And so to think about a Haitian making a bid for that. And then of course, you know, La Ferriere now is in the Académie Française. That blows my mind. He's like in Montesquieu's chair. That is so wild. You know what I mean? Yeah. And on the one hand, it's like, blow up the Academy. Like, who cares about the Académie Française? Like, is that really what we need to be caring about right now? And also, he got there. You know, there's something about that for me as a Haitian diaspora person. I'm like, yay, he got there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Even, as, even as even this book is like, it's not a book that's about Haitian nationalism in a specific way. It's not a, I mean, yet it's, 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 yet it's deeply Haitian in some ways in terms of its interest in primitive landscapes and its interest in questions of minor and major and, and, and also the reminiscences of like, you know, I, even the image of, the, of Mishima with the, um, the vowels and consonants buzzing, I mean, those are mosquitoes, you know what I mean? I mean, I think the thing too is that there's this beautiful way also in which, um, I mean, here the book, is, it's Mishima, right? So it's not, uh, in this moment, it's not, um, it's not Flaubert, for instance, right? So right. it's not doing this direct, like there is, obviously there's all the stuff around colonialism in it. But I think that there's a really interesting moment where he described, the narrator describes himself as like an explorer of the 19th century. Right. Um, and, um, I'm thinking, oh, you mean like a colonizer, <laughs> right? Correct, um, yeah. But actually, what's so interesting to me about that is that then what he does in this book, like the kind of, like, he played, but he's so consciously playing with cliche and stereotype. So, you know, it's, it's not the innocence of the, you know, the pretend innocence of colonialism, right? Like there is um, this idea of, I mean, there's so, it's so self-conscious, this book. You know, so there's a way in which he's really poking at these at these moments. So I think it's interesting that there are these moments that are so hyper 
self-conscious almost to the point where it, c- it can grate this book at moments. Oh, know? for sure. Um, <laughs> and at the same time, there are these moments just, that are so beautiful and like um, wistful or like there's, there's actual longing and um, loneliness and, you know, sense of, um, so that kind of longing to connect in these through books and through reading. Um, and um, I just think of that, the fact that those books that, that the Mishima, the, I think this is such a part of reading, right? Like books find us in these weird mm-hmm. ways. Um, so it wasn't like he was like, I'm interested in Japan. I'm going to go find a Japanese writer to read. Um, it just was in the cabinet, in the old cardboard, along with the bottle. It was just there. It's like, that's also about childhood and like, the magic and happenstance of our formations as human beings that there's something we don't know how it got there it's there and I will say as someone who um you know spent part of my childhood and has spent a lot of time in India um that that feels true to my experience of the world also that you know on the one hand we have a politics which sometimes get kind of narrowed into a very a particular axis of like metropole and you know um, the margins or whatever the world is actually much more interesting and um, layered and it doesn't mean, and that's not to negate clear like power distinctions right but there's a way in which things get through because people have hunger for um, books and ideas and, and I'm thinking also of um, the Ghanaian uh, writer Ama, uh, Atta Aidu who talked about you know mm-hmm. the school teacher in her village um, studying Russian Mm-hmm. and you know exposing the students to Russian and like you know you think in a little village you know reading in Africa you know um being exposed to Russian literature right um and it's again it's upending your notion of like what the what other places are like and who has access to what it can be super limiting I mean one of the things we talked about was as we were thinking about this book I'm a Japanese writer what are some objects that come to mind and I don't know if you're going to, well, maybe you never even saw this, but this strangely came to mind. Mm. This was a gift that my friend Clayla gave to me um, when I was leaving Mexico. So some people might know that I lived in Mexico for about a year and a half. And then after that, kept going back and forth. And so I made different friends. And this was a friend that I made in a really close-knit dance group that our dance class that I was in. And you came um, with me over to Clayla's house. And they were actually packing to leave their big, beautiful apartment to, to, to move someplace else. And do you remember that there was a song from a Bollywood film that came on the radio? And you started to sing along, and I might have been in like in Hindi, to this song that was on like Mexican public radio, and you and I were in our friends. I mean, there was something so layered about that, and that when she gave this to me, something that was from her house, I could just imagine someone else coming into my house and encountering this and having an experience with it that is similar in some ways to the way that Daniela Laferriere is encountering Mishima. Like we, we move around and then we gather things to us and they become a part of our landscapes and then other people encounter them. And that can spark all manner of really rich and interesting um, cultural and creative and social and political and amorous encounters. You know what I mean? And that's what I think is really exciting about this book and about a lot of Laferriere's work that it isn't, you don't need to be rich. You don't need to be white. You don't need to be edu- like formally educated to have different kinds of access to different places that are really meaningful. You just need to be in a social world mm-hmm. and, and be so, alive and awake and notice. And sometimes. interesting, interested because I feel like in this book, there's also the, uh, like the, um, the people who are not like him, like the accountants, <laughs> you know, who uh, I feel like there's this, you know, the sense of being of a, again, a particular type of person. The funny thing is um, the anecdote you just told about the Bollywood song, like I have no memory of it. And um, so that's also, I think the beautiful thing about life, like there are these things, like they're, like what we hold on to, the, the things that we keep. But since you spoke about Mexico, I'm gonna, we're, I'm gonna share a book. So I brought also an object and a couple of books that um, this book kind of made me think of. And one is a Mexican, um, book and one of so I I'm not a Japanese writer, but one of the things I think that's been interesting to me in my life um, is that um, I have been told um, once I was told by a 
professor that I was not a woman writer, mm. and which was fascinating. And I remember writing that down in my notebook as she was speaking because it was just too good. Um, and then um, also when I was in Mexico, um, a Mexican writer, it was a long conversation. There's a lot of context, but basically said, oh, well, you're a Mexican essayist. And I feel like I take both of these things as like, sure, I'm a Mexican essayist. And I think that there's something about Mexico also that allows for that. Um, but the book that I also wanted to just uh, share is this book by um, Mario Beatin. Mm. Uh, it's called Shiki Nagaoka, A Nose for Fiction. Wow. And so it's by uh, Mario Beatin, and it's about a Japanese writer. Um, mm. I'll just read this. Uh, Mexican novelist Mario Bellatin introduces the revolutionary, revolutionary work of a mysterious Japanese writer whose very existence has been all but erased from world literature. A writer who inspired Juan Rufo and Jose Maria Arguedas, Shiki Nagaoka's work has never been available in English. And as his most famous novel, which still hasn't been entirely deciphered, is written in an untranslatable language, so Be Beatin refuses to allow his portrait of a writer to end with the deformedly large nose that determined his life path by offering a thorough analysis of the writer's innovative use of photography and translation as an integral process in the production of his text. And, okay, so that's a lot of words. <laughs> but the thing about this book is that, again, like La Ferriere, Beatin is incredibly mischievous Right. And playful. So this is a book about a Japanese writer, Shiki Nagaoka. And of course, uh, the, the thing is that um, Mario Beatin made it all up. There is no right. writer named Shiki Nagaoka. Um, but, that kind of, but the fact that Shiki Nagaoka, this fictional Japanese writer, would be an influence on real life writers like Juan Rufo, for instance. Um, right. So it's just this playfulness around... Um, literature but tradition but lineage and tradition and how we you know what you were describing as like self-formation and a kind of capaciousness there that's not so strictly like you can only stay in your your ethnic racial national whatever lane you know that does seem very kind of latin american to me in, in various ways i mean or maybe it's just the association that i have with certain writers who do that i mean i even think about our friend marco villalobos who taught a class um where I was teaching a long time ago, and it was it was about kind of certain kinds of historical metafictions, and he he wrote this whole thing about when Gandhi came to like East LA, mm -hmm. and that they were trying to organize like a low like a low rider parade for Gandhi. He wrote it so well that we all thought it was true. I remember this. I mean, and it was so, it was like, it was so fantastical and yet it was written in such a way yeah. that it could have been absolutely true. Like Gandhi's world tour, where he was like, I need to go and see where other kind of people are. And then all these people are like, no, we want to do the cars for him or whatever. So it's just, it's just playfulness. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that in this book, I'm a Japanese writer, Laferrier says like, Westerners are afraid of ridicule. Mm -hmm. um, wait, in fact, that's on page three. I remember the first time yeah, I mean, that's the problem with Westerners. We're too afraid of ridicule. Being ridiculous won't kill us, but the fear of it will. So this sort of idea of like shoot for the moon and sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it's not going to work. But mm -hmm. what happens, even though he doesn't shy away from things like racism, I mean, it's not a book that is about, that's unaware of power or is unaware. In fact, one of the things that even this writer you're mentioning and certainly La Ferriere might also be thinking about is how so many kind of Anglo modernists just like went over to Asia and then did took whatever they said, whatever they wanted. Ezra Pound like translating from Chinese, dude couldn't even speak Chinese. I mean, just all of these different things and feeling like, oh, okay, well, if there's a history of that, what happens if I go there? With the knowledge that I have of what's problematic, but also is there space for me to play in that? And so that's something that feels potentially rich to me and also fraught and, and in moments kind of dangerous, you know? I mean, I think that there's so much um, fear around, we're in a moment obviously of a lot of discourse around cultural appropriation. And I think mm -hmm. it's because of all these histories of colonization and um, kind of uh, extraction of 
you know, people's stories and cultures. Um, but I think what's interesting, and I don't feel like there's an easy resolution to that in Danny Laferriere's book, but I think it's, um, what I like about it is it is complex. And he's constantly saying to people in the book, actually, he's like, I don't, he's like, I've never been to Japan. I don't know anything really about it. And it's kind of, again, everywhere there's slipperiness because he keeps saying, I don't know anything about it. I don't know anything about it. But every person is named after a Japanese writer. Right. You know, so there's a Ms. Tanaza Mr. Tanazaki and there's a, a Osamu Dazai and there's a, a Shonagan. And like, yeah, yeah, right. You know, so it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's just playful, you know, and, the, but he constantly says, no, this book is actually just about me. It's not about Japan. But it's a, then there's this reaction everyone has that's like, either how dare you write about Japan, say that you're a Japanese writer, or kind of a fascination. Right, fetish. But, you know, fetishization. So he's playing with all of that, right? Um, and yet for all of the kind of, um, uh, and, and, you know, there's some stuff here around gender, of course, that's like always a little troubling and makes you uncomfortable. Um, yeah, he needs to work on that a little bit. Um, so there's that, um, but I also think there's something about, um, but there's also tenderness, I think, in this book, and like in a few moments, um, like, you know, it's, it's and, um, you know, there's just, yeah, there's some, there's, there's a kind of melancholy at moments and a kind of tenderness as well, I think. There's also something, I mean, I just have to read, a, I have to bring up like the Bjork voodoo doll right now because I know soon our time will be up. And for me, as a person who is like a diehard lover of Bjork, although Utopia, I have some questions, but still, um, one thing he's doing, I think, is shifting like the power of influence. So for example, he's making like Haitian power and culture influential in a particular way. So there's this section where all of a sudden, like Bjork is is coming to do a show. I mean, is this, is this the Bjork voodoo doll? Yeah, well, except she, yes, and also she becomes, she I mean, becomes this is about provocation, like. Yeah. Um, Bjork, so it's this, I mean, it's, 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 it's a speculation even in, the, even in the text because it all yeah. is about like, well, how could Bjork be here to do this thing? Well, maybe Bjork came to town a day early because she absolutely had to see the big voodoo art show at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the great masters of Haitian painting, the peasant painters celebrated by Marot, the first worldwide show since the one organized at the Mellon in Manhattan in the, light, in the 1950s, Bjork, intrigued by voodoo, Bjork, as a little girl receiving a voodoo doll as a gift. Bjork, identifying with the doll, putting herself in the shoes of a little black girl who had to hide her doll because pleasure was forbidden. Bjork talking to the doll and the doll answering her. Look at the strange turn of Bjork's mouth and you'll understand you're not dealing with a pure-hearted, well-behaved little Icelandic girl, but a voodoo doll bloated with, Bjork, with blood. The doll has taken the girl named Bjork's place. Bjork hasn't grown an inch since. Bjork is the doll. And Bjork absolutely wants to see the show and meet the voodoo painters discovered in the 1940s. They're still alive. How can that be? And it keeps going on and on. And there's something about that that is so nuts and so amazing to me. And so ridiculous and also so wonderful. And it's just bringing to you and to your center the things that you want. It's making what your references are actually the center of all of the references. Um, and that's something I feel like I want to steal more as a writer. Just like, wait a minute, I don't necessarily need to go to them. What do I have working with me? And then how can, that, how can I bring others or whatever the other thing is to where to my center of cultural gravity and so that seems like a strategy I think that's operating in too book. about that moment I mean it's just it's so fun because again it's like you're like wait is Bjork is actually not a person but is actually a, a voodoo doll at the right um, so um, it's just it's so it, it, I think it, there's just a sense of like the liberty there's a kind of freedom um, also that he's expressing as a writer. And I mean, I think as you're suggesting, it's not, it's not random. You know, there's yeah. something, there's something under, so it's not about like, oh, as a writer, I can do anything I want. Although you might certainly feel that, but there's, there's a kind of, there's thinking there and there's something, there's energy there um, that I think is really interesting. But I think, you know, just as, as, since we're both writers also, right. Just to think about 
that he allows himself to just go there and be like, you know what, I'm just going to have Bjork really wanting to see, see this exhibition of voodoo paintings, and, but actually she actually is a doll. And, right. and then, you know, she's like, there's something, and the, the book is full of that. Um, so Very much. I think there's a whole thing about Yoko Ono having a rivalry with um, this young Japanese like artist. There's, right. there's all Yoko was yesterday's grandmother. Yeah. In the book. Yeah. yeah. And then Midori is in it. I mean, there's just like all kind of stuff. But I wanted to read that too as a, as a segue to a question for you. Yeah. Because that's, of course, a moment where Scandinavia then is all of a sudden, and I am a Japanese writer. And would you be willing to share a little bit about your relationship with Scandinavia? Well, I think the thing that I'll say is that part of what is so appealing to me about this book is that um, there's something about, I think he says something about being part of like a tribe of people who, uh, for whom imagination and desire means a lot, right? And to be able to take that seriously, mm -hmm. and that's part of your life, right? And so for me, ever since I was a child, um, uh, Denmark was my imaginary homeland, which tells you, again, it's like, you don't, you don't really get to choose even your imaginary homelands, because why would you choose Denmark? Per se? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Now all the Danish people have, are writing a strongly worded letter, but anyway. Um, but, it was, I mean, but it was an accident of immigration. And, you know, I just happened to read something in the Encyclopedia Britannica when I was an immigrant child in Detroit that um, about how the Danes were such a tolerant people, mm -hmm. also that they were a pure Teutonic stock, uh, which I didn't understand, uh, which helped me then just project. I thought, oh, they're so tolerant. I'm feeling really out of place in the US. But the Danes, they're so tolerant. That's where I belong. And of course, right. it's a big cosmic joke. Um, but I think, it, the way that that formed me was that ever since I was maybe seven or eight years old, I've always had this feeling of like this attachment to Denmark and Scandinavia, and it's part of my life. And so it's this connection that is not based in history, it's not based in, um, sorry, uh, genealogy and blood and all of that, but it's real to me, you know, and I think that those kinds of things, um, you know, are part of our lives, right? And I think it's something that, I, I think especially if you're not Anglo-American, maybe it's easier to kind of comprehend these kinds of things. Although sometimes things get flattened out, like someone could say like, oh, Madhu, like you, you are interested in Scandinavia. Are you ashamed of your Indian heritage or are you self-loathing? I mean, so that there can be a, a flattening out of like either you are pro-nationalist or you, you really deeply are grounded in your own heritage and love it or you despise it and, and only are interested in things, like you would only be interested in things, especially European things, Northern, Western, or even Eastern European things, if you had a kind of um, negative sense of your own background, which has not been my experience of people at all. And I think that's where it's also, I think we get confused about being interested in a thing as, a, as content, and then the ground that we're coming from. Right, mm -hmm. to be interested in that thing. So in the same way, like, you know, earlier with what I said about Danny LaFerriere saying, like identifying as a kind of 19th century explorer, right? So, and he says, this is, a, this is all happening in my head. This is all happening in my room. I'm not going to Japan. I'm not really interested in like the, you know, all the complexities of it. And, but it's such a smart move because that's what Orientalists and, um, you know, colonizers were doing was, they were projecting an idea, an image. I mean, they were also going over there, but before they were going, you know, there were these images of um, the Orient. Um, when I think about like John de Mandeville writing about like the Indians and saying, oh, they have their feet on backwards and they have extra arms and, you know, all these I, like mythical ideas of people, peoples. And it's like, but this idea of like not going to the, not experiencing the place, but having this construct that's created at home. And so he's turning it, you know, he's like upending that. And I think, you know, to be able to be, say, to say that you're interested in something um, is not an abdication of your own kind of experiential, like lived life. So I think it's, in fact, like my story about being interested in Denmark is because I was Indian. Right. And felt that there wasn't space to be Indian somehow in the Midwest when I was a young child. It was this other thing. It was a third thing. Um, but it so much rooted in, like, my love of Scandinavia is so much rooted in, um, like, a really deep grounding and love of 
you know, India, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I think that we, yeah, so I think that that's where, and similarly, to bring it back to Daniel Carrier, I think that that's where in this book, it's like, it, there are these little, there's these few moments um, when Haiti comes up. It's not, um, it, it, there are not many, but it's so clearly there, you know, oh, as, yeah. as the ground, as like, you know, the childhood, the grounding, his grandmother, the figures he saw when he was like, you know, walking, his relationship to books. Yeah. Um, really. and, and his friend, his strange friend that I don't think we'll have time to talk about, but, um, but I guess, um, there's a lot more what we could say, but I think we should probably um, wrap up. Do you have anything you want to? No, this is just super fun. Um, I just want to know the names of the other books that you had in your object. Well, I know we don't have a lot of time, but just okay. if you think. So really there. quickly, the book, I, there's two books I wanted to share, but I can't find them in my apartment. So um, one was um, actually um, a book, uh, Papi by Rita Indiana. Um, oh, yeah. And writer. And, I just love her also because I want like she, as a woman writer like she's just super interesting and kind of like out there and does her own thing. Um, and the other book is maybe a little bit more well known, but there's a book of like um, one act plays by Federico Garcia Lorca, surrealist plays. Oh, uh, imaginary about, dreams. Um, imaginary. Barbarous Nights is the volume that I have. Ah, okay. Uh, the Little Theater, basically. And then I actually did this week read. Basho. Yay. Uh, because That's a good. Basho is like the central kind of muse, I guess, of Danny Laferriere and um, I am a Japanese sure. writer. So um, I did read Basho and have no clearer understanding of I am a Japanese writer. But <laughs> okay, so I'll just say that. Um, oh, wait, what was your object? Oh, just okay. I have this little heart. Mm. And the story behind this, sorry, it's a little bit of a story, but is that a friend of mine gave me this heart in January. And I like, I was like, I was like, oh, thank you so much. It was after dinner. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And I put it into my mouth and I was about to bite it. And she's like, it's not candy. <laughs> it's like ceramic. And it was just this moment. I was like, oh my God, someone loved me, but I almost could have died. Right. Because I was about to ingest this thing. And there's just this moment in Daniel Ferrier's book where he says, um, he just says something like, I'm not going to be able to find it. Uh, or he says, beware of those who love you. So my thing is just my usual, like, d'ombre by Jacqueline Bourget rosier which for me, I'm a Japanese writer. It's like this claim for our, about identity or play with identity. And so much of me trying to translate this over the many decades now is trying to negotiate my own relationship to Haitian identity and Haitianness. And then one other thing is, oh, dear Haiti, love Alain, which is a very, it's a, by these two sisters, Michael Moulit and Maritza Moulit. And it's sort of like a, a Haitian American uh, book, and I'm going to send it to my sister. So these are some of the things that um, came up for me when I was thinking about ref like relationships to this book. Cool. Well, thanks for this conversation. It's been fun and it's super fun. Um, and um, everyone enjoy the rest of this incredible online festival and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.